Hello, Super Meat. That's the end of the presentation. Uh, is everyone having a good time? Awesome. Fantastic. I love this event. 15 years, I think that's amazing. I just want to say, I don't want to sound too cheesy, to Michael, to Dan, everyone that organizes this thing for us that we come to and love every year. Thank you guys, you guys are awesome. So I am here as usual, because I've been here for like four years in a row now, which is a real honor, to share with you the, we think, very exciting things that we've been working on uh, in Adobe Creative Cloud over the last several months. As usual, at the show, we're revealing brand new versions of all our creative desktop products, and I'm going to share with you some of the amazing new features we're working on. So, the thing that I'm really humbled and privileged mostly about on the products I work on is the customers that use them. It's been an incredible ride. We really are just so excited about the people we work with, and we really just run, we run the gamut, is that the right expression, between all, the different, all these different types of work, from sort of new creative people, web-based creative people like Rocket Jump, all the way through to, and I still can't quite believe I get to say this, people like Walter Murch, who's now cutting his latest documentary um, on Premiere Pro, which is just amazing and cool. And I don't mean to sound like I'm showing off, but it's very exciting. You'll also know that the Coen Brothers switch, they just cut Hell Caesar, that wonderful movie Hell Caesar on Premiere Pro. And there's something that we probably haven't mentioned much, so just to remind you, we're thrilled to be able to say that Deadpool, did someone clap? One person's clapping. That pr person probably works for Adobe, but okay, that's fine. Deadpool, which over, just exceeded all of our expectations, the biggest R-rated movie ever. Feel free to read all these lines yourselves. Cut exclusively on Premiere Pro. One of the things that I'm most excited, that we're most excited about with Deadpool is it was actually not a really huge budget production. And it was th the ability to work between Premiere Pro and After Effects and do all those incredible shots that really made them able to create what they created. And I think anyone who's seen it will agree it was pretty awesome. So we've got so many new features coming to Creative Cloud. Like I say, these are things coming soon for you guys that it's really hard to demo them all. So I thought this year, instead of trying to, I would just show you this slide and just stand here while you read it. <laughs> Is that cool? Just give me a break, you know, it's been a long day. So I don't get to show you all of these things. If you are going to the show, please stop by the booth. I know not all of you do, but if you do, there's loads of stuff on the web where you can see it. But it's a really exciting release coming. I'm going to focus, if you don't mind, on Premiere Pro today. But amazing performance enhancements in After Effects, a fantastic new thing in Audition, which is called the Essential Sound Panel, which is for everyone who's not a fully trained audio engineer like myself. Um, just it helps you get successful with audio very easily. Think Lumetri for sound. Fantastic new features. I can't talk to all of them. But what I am going to do is try and talk to some of them. So let's go and look at what's coming in Premiere Pro, shall we? Yes. Yes, we shall. It's all right. I'm just, I'm just needy. If you've ever seen me present before, you know I'm very needy. OK. So that's interesting. That's not doing what it should. But never mind. We'll just come down here. There we go. All right. So the first thing I want to tell you about that's coming to Premiere Pro is something that you guys, many of you, have been asking us to focus on and do for a long time. It's very important, and it's increasingly important with modern workflows. It is also not terribly sexy. So bear with me on this. And that is new functionality for media management when you're working with files, which you all are. So we know that now people are having to work with bigger media files than ever before. You know, it was last year, the year before last, it was all about 4K. We're all working with 4K now. It's become the standard. And increasingly, we're talking about things like 6K and 8K, and things like higher frame rates, higher dynamic range. Files are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And no matter how hard you try, and no matter how powerful a machine you have, if you're trying to work natively with that media, sometimes you're going to just lose some performance. Premiere Pro has always been about native media format support, and we still are. And every release, we add new native formats. This release is no different. Things like 8K Red Weapons supported. Still pretty much any camera on the market, you can just bring in, and it'll work natively. However, 
if you want to work on a lighter weight device or you're working with those big files, this new media management functionality is going to help you be successful. So I'm going to show you how it works. You're going to find in the new project dialog, and I have a project opens, obviously, so I'm just going to do it here. In, also in the project settings dialog, a new tab, it says ingest settings. By default, and we always make sure this is the case, Premiere Pro will do what it always does, which is just reference files on disk. You point to them, you bring them in, you work with them, that's how it works. So don't worry, we're not forcing you to do anything different here. However, should you want to be more advanced with your media management, you can go into these ingest settings and do a few different things. I'm going to check the ingest box. That fires the dialog box up. And you'll notice I've got four options in my drop-down menu. For those of you who've used Prelude before, this is a very similar workflow. You can just copy your media from the camera. We can check some. We can make sure that the media is correct and healthy and well, uh, if you want us to. The great thing is if you're bringing media in from somewhere else, from, a, from, from a, a red mag or some camera media, whatever, you can start cutting it right away, and we'll swap to the copies when the copy is complete. So very quick. One person was excited by that. That's cool. You can also, if you want to transcode, and we always said you don't need to transcode in Premiere Pro, and you don't need to transcode in Premiere Pro. OK, you don't need to, but you can transcode to a house format, should you want to. The really interesting thing here is that you can, I, I, that I think that you can bring that full res media in, put it on your fast storage, but also choose to create proxy media. Once you create that proxy media, it's automatically associated with the full res, and you just toggle between the two. It's really, really straightforward. It's preset driven. We're going to ship with a bunch of presets, as you can see in here, and we, we won't ship with Al's ingest preset. That's one I made. Very easy preset driven workflow. You'll bring those proxies in. You'll associate them with the full resolution media. And once you've done that, and this is the really nice thing, there's just a simple switch, as you would probably expect. That switch shows up in both the source and program monitors. You can see it down here. There it is. So this is full 6K red media. And now the great thing about 6K red media is it is pretty performant. But once you start building up tracks, you start doing more things, maybe switching to these low-res proxies is, easy, is something you'd want to do. And so all you do, click the button. And immediately, and I probably should have put a watermark on my proxies or something to show you this is really happening, but immediately I switch to that low res. One of the cool things is we're going to ship with a preset that lets you put your proxy files inside your creative cloud files directory. That means it'll sync to the cloud. You'll have access to your small files wherever you go, and you can sync back to, or, or conform back, if you will, uh, to full res whenever you want to. I told you it. OK, cool. Yeah. So that's media management. Let's see if I can open this bottle of water successfully. Now let's talk about color. Because color, we know, we've talked about this before. Color, we know, is an important part of every editor's life. And you know, I'm just going to play this back so we've got something to look at while I'm talking. We know that color has become an, a critical part of the editing process. I talked about this last time I was here. You guys, editors, need to be creative with color all the way through the process. And we've added significant, powerful color tools to the application, which were really focused mainly on the Lumetri panel in that color workspace. And we've got a whole host of really exciting new color features in this release to take you that one step further, or several steps further, I might say. So let's just jump into the color workspace. I'm going to show you a few new features in here. Firstly, we know that. Um, you guys wanted some improvements in the scopes. We focused on that. You're going to find much higher resolution in the scopes. You can also, if you want to, depending on the kind of media you're working on or the kind of space you're working on, you can actually change the brightness of your scopes. This was commonly requested. You can change to bright, normal, or dimmed scopes. Also, as you start needing to work with wider color gamut media, you're also going to be able to monitor Rec 2020 in those scopes as well. So let's talk about the Lumetri panel. We've, we, I've said to you many times before, I like to say that like I'm always here. It's not quite true, is it? But I've said sometimes before to some people that the Lumetri panel was all about letting editors be successful with color without needing to go into complex, potentially confusing color grading applications. Of course, you still can should you want to, but Lumetri is about fast, successful, beautiful looks. So we've added some significant new functionality to it. So I'm just going to start by jumping into my creative section here. 
we are, I'm going to just jump to a slightly better clip as well. Why don't we think that'll do? So the first thing in the creative section has always been you start by, if you want to, you start by adding a preset look. Very excited to be working alongside Look Labs this release. We now include their entire linear bundle of looks. They're beautiful, they're single click. They're going to get you to a very good place in just one click. So that's really exciting, I think, anyway. So I can tab through those and I can select what I want to. But what we're really excited about this go around is the addition, and again, this is something that was requested a great deal by you guys, the addition of secondaries inside the Lumetri panel. And that easy, <laughs> it's all for you. They're easy, they're fast, and they're good, and the guy from Adobe would say that, but I'm really confident that it's true. So let me show you how our secondaries work. Guess what I'm gonna do with secondaries in this shot? What do you think? Going to change the color of his hat, maybe? Nah. All right, so let's jump down to secondaries. I'll show you how our secondaries feature works. So the first thing we need to do with the secondary, as some of you, most of you know, is we have to make a qualification. We have to select a color range. That's how this is going to work. There's various ways to do this. You'll notice there are color pickers at the top, which I could use. But like I keep saying, we're trying to make this as easy and fast as possible. So a really nice way to get started is to use those, uh, the color swatch above the HSL parameters. That jacket is kind of pinkish, as I'm sure you'll all agree. So I'm going to click on the kind of pinkish button, which is officially what it's called. Click there. And that immediately does a qualification. Now, of course, it's not going to be perfect. Of course, I'm going to need to tweak it, but it's going to get you to a place where you can quickly ma uh, manipulate and make changes. So I've clicked on the pinkish button, and now I what I want to do is really just dial that mask in and make a good selection of the jacket. So first of all, I'm going to manipulate and move around the hue parameter just to make sure the color range I've selected is accurate. Really, really nice thing here is the minute I pick it up and move it around, I'm seeing the mask straight away. Don't need to toggle it on or off. It's just showing me the mask, which is pretty cool, right? Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> you're a tough crowd tonight. You all, you all a bit sad? What's going on? Come on. <laughs> Thank you. I paid that guy. All right. So, here we go. So, I'm making a selection of the pink of the jacket, but because nothing is ever perfect, um, I'm actually picking up some of the, uh, the, the, the black and white stripes of whatever that item of clothing underneath this very fashionable young gentleman is. So I'm going to pull away and I'm going to go ahead and now I'm going to make some further manipulation. This time I'm going to pull in a little bit of the saturation to try and dial out that uh, the, the, the sweatshirt and dial just in that jacket. So let's go up here and choose the saturation parameter. I'm going to pull that in. So that's two clicks and one drag, right? That's hit, pick the swatch, change the color, do the drag, and I've made a pretty a, a, a successful mask. I'll show you that again very, very quickly. So hopefully you're going to find it really easy to make the selections to, make, to, uh, to be creative with. Great. Hurrah. So once I've done that, because this is Lumetri, I have simple, intuitive, understandable parameters at the bottom. They're the same parameters that you saw in the creative section. You don't need to go and learn a load of complex color science to be able to be successful here. So, for example, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do this at random, so don't criticize my, uh, you know, my, 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 my uh, <laughs> just don't criticize me, ever. Because uh, I really just can't, I just can't take it. <laughs> Anyway, so I'm going to wiggle my temperature around. You can see I can just pull that down a little bit. I can make a, t a tint adjustment. This is all going to play in real time because it's all GPU optimized. It's all perfect, and it's all, it's all perfect. It's all great. It's all running on the GPU. So that's Lumetri Secondaries. I'm going to show you one more thing real quick because this is cool. Thank you. The previous shot is very similar, as you'll notice. But I don't want to have to do it again, so I just, I just think this is a nice little workflow. Oops, see Daisy? I'm going to jump into my ECP, pick the Lumetri color up, copy, go back here, paste, done. So that's really simple. So I'm so glad you're excited. There's so much other color stuff in this release as well. We have support for control surfaces. And many other things I can't remember because I'm a bit nervous. So that's color. We're going to keep working on color. 
So the last thing I want to show you today, because I never have enough time to show you everything, is our new support for the buzziest buzzy thing that's ever buzzed in this buzzy industry, VR. So let's have a look at what we've done with VR. VR, I think, is really, really interesting. Sorry, I'm just trying to get this in the right place. Come on, behave, not that, come on. The interesting thing, I think, about VR, or one of the many interesting things about VR is it gives us the opportunity to go to places, experience things that we just wouldn't normally be able to experience, that we know maybe places we could never visit, you know, just uh, getting feels for things that we'd never really be able to do otherwise. I think that's really powerful. That's what makes me really excited about it. So I thought I'd give you all an incredible treat and treat you to something that very few of you have ever been able to experience, and that is the inside of this room with nobody in it. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> so I took this earlier when I arrived. And this is taken on a Ricoh Theta camera, uh, cheap and really very cool. If you've not seen them, I recommend you look at them. The way VR works in Premiere Pro is you're going to bring the stitched equirectangular media in. You're going to use an external stitcher, currently at least, and you're going to bring the equirect media in. This is a still image. We're going to start with a still image. That's a still equirect frame I took on my Theta. If you're working with an expensive 16-camera GoPro rig, you would just use an external stitcher, and we support many of them. I mean, we support the frame, you know what I mean. So, we kind of discovered that <laughs> the only problem with the Ricoh Theta is the sort of terrifying mutant body part that you see at the bottom, so try not to focus on that. So once you've brought that Equirec frame in, it looks like that, and that's okay, and you can edit with that stuff natively, of course you can, and we actually discovered that many of you, many people already were editing with it natively, but that doesn't give you a feel for what it would be like to wear a headset or to be inside the sphere. So what we've got now is preview mo uh, the, the ability to preview being inside the sphere and move around it. So I'll very quickly show you how it works. You're going to go into the wrench menu here in, the, in either of the two monitors, and you're going to choose the VR video drop-down. This is actually a VR still, which is not really a thing, but work with me here. I'm going to go into my settings. This is monoscopic. We'll talk about stereoscopic in a minute, because obviously a lot of VR is in stereo. I, I'm going to leave those sit settings as they are. It's 360, and I'm going to have a view of 120. OK. There is then a new, another new button. It's all about the new buttons. We'll turn proxy off there. It's all about the new buttons. There's a new button to enable VR, toggle VR video display. I'm going to click on that, and immediately I am looking inside the sphere. So you straight away are going to see some new controls. You can see a tilt control at the top and a kind of pan control at the bottom. So I can tilt around in the sphere by using this control. How cool is this? This is cool, right? And I can pan, <laughs> and I can pan around. And that's how I generally feel <laughs> before I have to demo at Supermeet. So that's cool, we've got those controls around there, but you've all, let's, let's move away from that terrifying image, shall we? But you've actually, well, no, actually, no, let's leave it, it's quite funny. Um, but you all know, you've, I'm sure you've all experienced the, the 360 experience in YouTube or Facebook where you click drag around inside the frame. Well, guess what? You can obviously do that as well. So super easy to get a preview of your VR. Let's jump to some video stuff. This is something that my dear friend Jenny Appleton shot on Golden Gate Bridge. Or, well, not on the bridge, obviously, but near the bridge. This is, so this is the piece of real video. This was shot on an eight-camera GoPro rig. Exactly the same thing applies with video, as you'd expect. I go ahead, change the settings. Monoscopic, yes, 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 yes. And I'll start playing it back. And in real time, as it plays back, I can move around and monitor that VR video. So this is a really nice experience. Lastly, in 45 seconds, let's look at stereo VR, because lo lots of VR is being shot. Oh, that, that doesn't look right, does it? Lots of VR is being shot in stereo, and we know you need to be able to work with that. This is uh, over, under, left eye, right eye, stereoscopic media, just like the other stuff. All I've got to do is tell Premiere Pro that that's what it is, and so I will go into my settings. I'll say it's stereo, over, under, like so, and then I choose whether or not I want to focus on the left eye or the right eye, because this screen, no matter how hard we try, is two-dimensional. Incidentally, 
If you want to work with headsets, you want to be able to plug in an Oculus and, and get that experience, you can. They're supported by third-party plugins. There are several of them. Um, we're not doing it ourselves in Premiere Pro yet, but there's loads of great third parties out there that can do it. If you don't have an expensive stereo headset like an Oculus Rift and you want to get a feel for what that stereo media looks and feels like, however, we've put a really neat, really awesome little feature in this, in this software which lets you use the cheapest VR headset available to mankind, a $1 pair of red-green anaglyph glasses. I can just jump into anaglyph mode, and now when I go into VR, I was tr trying to bring the glasses to wear them for you, but I couldn't. Now when I jump into VR, I'm actually going to get a sense of what the depth is with that, those really cheap that really cheap pair of glasses. So that's VR, the new features for VR, coming soon to Premiere Pro. I've talked a little bit too long, as usual. Thank you so much for listening to me. Go see our demos at the booth. We were outside there. Thank you so much. Have a great show. Thank you.